Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Blue is the New White podcast. Today we sit down with someone who's just as passionate about the trades as I am. So much so that he's leading a brilliant initiative to honor those in the trades, inform those not in the trades, and empower those who want to be in the trades. Chris Brenchley, or CB, is the co-founder and CEO of Shorehand and the driving force behind the Rock the Trades initiative. Today, we talk on all aspects of the industry, from the perceptions to the importance and to what can and will be done in the future to drive the industry forward. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation. I know I did. And be sure to find and follow Rock the Trades on social and hop over to their website at rockthetrades.com to learn more. As always, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and on our website at blueisthenewwhite.com to receive all the latest updates. As always, this show's not monetized and we don't run ads. We rely strictly on the word of mouth from our listeners to further the mission. So if you enjoy this episode, please take a second to rate it, review it, and share it. The future generations of tradespeople depend on it. They depend on you. So thank you again and enjoy this episode of the Blue is the New White podcast with the driving force himself, C.B. Welcome back to another episode of the Blue is the New White podcast. Today, we've got an awesome guest who was introduced to me by the guest that I had on our 100th episode, Miss Barbie the Welder. And today, Chris Brenchley, or CB, as he's commonly referred to. He is the co-founder and CEO of Surehand and the driving force behind the Rock the Trades initiative. Chris, welcome to the Blue is the New White podcast. Hey, Josh. So good to be here. I really appreciate you having me on to talk about what we're up to with Rock the Trades. Absolutely. I'm excited to get into it. The world needs to know, my friend, and uh, you're going to help me tell them. So uh, for those that don't know who you are, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience and kind of let us know where you come from and how you got to where you are today. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you said, I'm uh, uh, CEO of uh, Surehand, and Surehand is a, it's a tech startup. We're up here in Silicon Valley. Uh, we're venture funded by uh, Stanley Black & Decker, the good folks that put tools on the shelves at Home Depot and Lowe's and Ace Hardware and the like. Um, and we spun the company up about three years ago to essentially go after sort of solving a lot of the friction and issues in the industrial uh, labor markets across energy manufacturing construction. So that's sure hand and that's, you know, my role there. In terms of my background, you know, I've spent, oh gosh, almost 30 years in the sort of digital innovation um, uh, uh, realm, if you will. And I've, you know, I've run uh, work for uh, innovation centers of excellence for large companies like uh, Walters Kluwer, Thomson Reuters, very large multinational organizations to, you know, bootstrapped startups out of my back pocket, right? And so that's a world I think you're familiar with as you have grown your business over time. Um, but I would say sort of the red thread for me that kind of rolls through kind of that 30-year career is I you know, I've spent sort of that time doing two things. One, I help companies do new things fast, very quickly. How do they sort of be, a, uh, uh, how do they cause sort of positive disruption in the, in the markets that they serve? And I would say the second thing, and the one that's germane to our conversation today is, you know, the bulk of that time I had spent in, you know, adult learning, corporate training type solutions, largely B2B uh, type uh, products and services, almost all digital and online. But the focus of that work is helping adult working professionals sort of achieve their, their full potential. And to be honest with you, the bulk of that time was centered really more around, I think, white collar workers and those professions. And you know what really excited me about Surehand um, was the opportunity to sort of extend that work into the blue and gray collar arenas uh, and focus sort of on a different segment of the workforce. Uh, and do it in a way that wasn't just focused on the sort of learning and training side, but also really get at, you know, really helping folks, you know, find work when they need it or, you know, advance their careers and skill sets. All right. And and why is that important to you? Uh, you know, I think we can all do a lot of things with our time, right? I mean, we could, I could do what I do for, you know, could go sell soap 
shampoo or, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and the thing I've always liked about this realm is it is, it is really uh, about, uh, you know, really making a difference out there for people. And, you know, I, I, I particularly am mindful of, you know, the disruption that was caused by the last year, everything that's happened with COVID-19 and the global pandemic and the economic disruption that has occurred uh, tragically for, for too many. Um, and, and so, you know, while I think that that was something that was important to me before last year, I think now that's even, you know, I have a lot more clarity around that. And again, really just helping, you know, folks, um, you know, succeed and excel and sort of achieve their dreams and do it in a way that kind of, uh, you know, feeds their interests and ambitions, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And you and I have had enough conversations now to, to know how like-minded we are and especially the blue collar space, as you had mentioned. And, you know, you mentioned COVID and I'm curious to get your take as somebody, you know, in, in that, uh, area of the, of the industry, you know, what did we kind of see in the blue collar world during COVID that was different than the white collar world? Uh, you know, it's a great question. I think for us, some of the things we saw, I mean, our beachhead market, and again, we're only a couple years, a few years into this, uh, was in energy more narrowly, the oil and gas sector and petrochemical industry. And so one of the things we saw was, you know, the combination of the uh, oil gas or oil price wars uh, in Q1 last year, followed by, you know, the significant drop in demand uh, um, in the oil and gas uh, market, uh, drop in the price of barrel of oil, all that sort of contributed to essentially what I would call a, a real freeze in hiring activity. A lot of folks were laid off. There's a lot of furloughs out there. And so that obviously impacted our business. Um, you know, I think the good news is, um, you know, we're starting to see, you know, that start to rebound on our side. And as you and I have talked about before, you know, we at Surehand have expanded our focus to the manufacturing uh, sector. And we'll do, we'll probably get into construction as we head into 2022, heavy civil and commercial. And so what I would say, generally speaking, compared to white collar, um, and, and this is my own personal take, is I think that, you know, the pandemic has shown us who the essential workers really are, right? The folks that had to show up, do the work day in, day out, despite the risk to their health, to their families and so on. So I think when I look at, you know, beyond energy and I look at manufacturing, I look at construction, these are folks that just, kept going out to the job site, kept going out to the plants and the factories and doing the work, right? Not to say that white collar professionals weren't working, but I would say that, you know, in all candor, we were inconvenienced by um, the pandemic in the sense that many of us can do our job. You know, I could do my job from home. I can do it anywhere I have a, a good internet uh, connection, for example. Uh, and so, you know, I think for me, I was mindful of the importance of these jobs beforehand and these workers beforehand. But I think the pandemic has really cast a light and raised awareness in some ways of just how important these jobs are. And they truly are the backbone of our nation's economy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't have said that better myself. And, you know, the, the next thing I'm wondering is kind of on the same wavelength, right? And, and I'm going to ask you a setup question first, but I'm going to, uh, I want to compare this, um, you know, you said COVID brought to light who the essential workers were. I think COVID also brought something else to light in the college realm. But first, I want to ask you kind of what your perception of a traditional college education is and maybe what it was at one point in your life compared to what it is today. Yeah, that's a, wow, that's a big question to unpack, but uh, a great setup. But uh, here's what I would say, uh, Josh, and you and I have talked about this too. I think you know, it's changing, certainly. I mean, you're seeing a lot more emphasis out there uh, across all color professions on the importance of uh, skills, on the importance of aptitude and interest. Like, does the person have the skills or the aptitude to learn the skills and interest in doing so or the passion for the work as, you know, in, important criteria when making hiring decisions, right? And I think that's, you know, it's certainly true or becoming more true in the white collar space, right? Initiatives, you know, from Google and others uh, and other uh, folks out there in the sort of broader talent ecosystem are kind of having a hard look at that relative to, oh, in order to get a job, you need this piece of paper from this institution that says, 
yada, yada, yada. Like I can do this work. So I think that's one shift that's happening uh, right now, uh, just generally. And, and, you know, I would say with the blue collar world and you're, you're, you know, you're, you, you know, you've come up uh, in, in that, in that world. And I think, you know, I do think the, there may be a difference in the sense that in the blue collar world, there is the expectation and in many ways need for folks to show up uh, on the job day one and, and do the work and get it done safely. So this, this need to understand, skill, have the skills, to, ha to have expertise or experience with the tools they're using in this sort of field of application that they're using it in. Um, that said, I, you know, I hear all the time about, I mean, I think the trades is very much about on the job training and learning as you go, growing as you go, whether you're in a formal apprenticeship program or you're working for a company that's investing heavy in training and upscaling and so on. And we're hearing a lot more of those programs happening as well. So I, I think the way I would characterize it is, you know, as you and I have talked about uh, sort of outside of this conversation, um, you know, college is, is fine. There's nothing wrong with college, but it's really not the best fit starting point for everybody. And, and I think uh, my sense is, you know, the markets are starting to realize that uh, employers, particularly in the industrial sector, who are hurting for talent, and we can talk more about that, um, you know, they're starting to rethink, you know, who they're looking for, what do they need to have coming in the door, and there's more and more uh, companies in the sector willing to, you know, upskill and invest in training people up, assuming, you know, they're accountable, they'll show up to do the work, be eager to learn, be ready to work, uh, and so on. So I do think the narrative around you know, if you want to be successful, you got to go to college and get a four-year degree, uh, you know, even even beyond what we're doing with Rock the Trades and that initiative, um, you know, I think we're starting to see some of these macro shifts happening, uh, again, across all collars, not just, you know, in the white collar world. I think it's happening, blue collar, gray collar, you know, yeah. all of it. No, absolutely. And, and I think that uh, a lot of the students are starting to see this too, especially with COVID, you know, there's there's a big difference when you're paying twenty five thousand dollars a year or whatever it is to go to a university and have that college experience compared to when you're paying that same tuition and asking to do it all online. Um, I think that it, it it kind of created almost a, a shift in perception of the value that they're getting because you know a, a a big thing is and again like you I'm not against college I just think you know. The, the right education for the right individual is the most important thing. And the second most important thing being the ROI that you can generate from that education. Um, you know, but as this, this COVID thing happened and, and these students are, are being asked to do all of these courses and, and things like that online, it, it began, I think, to make them a little bit more aware of some of the other things and the other values that college has that people often get more experience from, like uh, the networking aspect is something that I, I hear a, a lot about when I talk to people who've gone to, to college in the traditional route. And, you know, a lot of them had, do say that, hey, you know, the people that I met in college far outweigh the education that I got, which is kind of sad, really. I mean, it's good, right? It, 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 it's a good thing, <laughs> but it's a little bit sad because you you pay all that money to to get that education. And again, lot of variables, right? Instructors and, and colleges and, you know, all of that stuff. But still, I think it was a, a, a bit of a, an eye opener for a lot of people out there, if nothing else, to what their options actually are. Yeah, it's a great point. And I think you use the expression traditional route, right? And that's the thing we're really poking at with Rock the Trades, which is, you know, um, you know, as you and I have discussed, I mean, we, we launched Rock the Trades as a workforce development initiative, really focused on celebrating and honoring the skilled uh, industrial workers in America, the tradespeople in the industrial sector who, you know, build, operate, and maintain the world we live in. You know, the office I'm sitting in, the car I drove down to the office, the roads and bridges I drove over getting here, those were all built and are maintained by these folks, right? And I think we've all sort of, I, I don't wanna, that's a broad statement. I think it's too easy to lose sight of, you know, the hardworking, uh, intelligent, uh, committed uh, industrial artists that are actually doing the work to make the world we live in possible. So, you know, that was sort of part of it. And, you know, there's two 
outcomes we're trying to drive with this. One is to raise awareness of the skilled industrial trades as a fulfilling and financially rewarding career path. Um, and then the second is to empower those who choose them to embark upon that journey. And it's really important, you know, when you say traditional route, it, I mean, it is really important to note that blue collar households already understand the value of, uh, you know, these uh, skilled trade career paths. You know, this is not, this is not news to them. You know, those that we hear over and over again, you know, how'd you get into your trade? Well, my uncle, my father, my friends, you know, they got into it because of their network, right? That they had, and they understood the value, financial reward, fulfillment, work-life balance, all these things that could come from that kind of work. Um, and for us, it's about how do we raise awareness outside of that echo chamber, that bubble, right? And how do we sort of cross-pollinate the value of uh, skilled industrial trades careers into the white collar world, into the world that I came up in, right? Because as I've shared multiple times, you know, this isn't, we're not, we're, we're by no means anti-college. College is a great fit for a lot of people. Uh, a lot of variables, as you mentioned, uh, including, you know, what field are you going into? If you want to go be a surgeon or you want to go be a lawyer or you want to get into a specialty, you know, profession like that, you're going to have to go to college. You're probably going to need to get an advanced degree. And you're making the bet, assuming that you're interested in that kind of work, that it's going to pay off in the end, to your point. You're going to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in that education. Well, if you become a brain surgeon or you become a top litigator, you're going to be okay, right? You're going to get that return. I think the challenge is when you have folks that are really uncertain yeah. coming out of high school, separating from the military, and what do I want to do? And then what's presented to them is this narrative that is go to college, go in undeclared, you'll figure it out as you go. I think that's where things start to come off the rails a bit. And what we're trying to do with Rock the Trades is very simply, you know, on the menu for someone like that, take a good hard look at the skilled industrial trades. You might be surprised pleasantly by what you find, you know, to become a welder, to become a machinist, to get into, you know, become an HVAC refrigerant tech. I mean, whatever the path, whatever the trade, you know, the aha for us as we've gone through our journey with Surehand the last few years is, you know, these are rewarding career paths. These are, you know, the, we meet a lot of happy people yeah. <laughs> in the trades. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. No, oh, absolutely. A, a great response, by the way, to that. And and I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, looking at it from a bird's eye view, it, it's actually pretty simple, right? It, it's a marketing problem. I think that uh, uh, it's not... I say this all the time. I'm going to sound like a broken record to my audience, but it's not that the the trades are necessarily actively shit on, right? It's not that everyone is like, no, the trades are absolutely horrible. You can't do that. And I've I've heard some stories, you know, otherwise like, oh, you're you're too smart to be a plumber, you know, that kind of stuff. But it's nothing ever malicious. Everybody always wants the best for for their their students or their children or whatever that may be, you know. And it's it's about presenting the option on the same level with the same type of, uh, you know, success potential, if you will, as that college route, as the things that are typically pushed onto our students or into those, you know, uh, looking to change careers or whatever it may be. The first instinct is formal education, you know, when really the first instinct should be, here's your options. Now let's choose how to go forward. Um, so, you know, I, I, so I guess the question is, you know, how can we as, uh, as a community, as uh, an industry, you know, as educators, how can we market this better to reveal those truths that aren't often said? Yeah, look, uh, you know, I, I agree 100% on the whole perception issue. And, you know, in, in today's social media, cable news network fueled, you know, constant 24-7 barrage of information from everywhere, you know, oftentimes perception is the reality, right? Whether that's intentional, unintentional, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. And, uh, you know, look, we're, we're combating 30 years of this college first, college by default narrative with Rock the Trades. And again, it's not it is all about presenting the trades in that positive light. And, you know, our take, my hypothesis on this, and really at the center of Rock the Trades, the initiative, is, you know, as I thought about this problem, 
you know, this narrative. And, and I started thinking more deeply about it. Like, you know, for the last five, 10, 15, 20 years, I know that there have been, you know, there's been a lot of energy, investment, talent, focus put in the solving this problem. Like how do we sort of reverse this narrative and put the skilled trades back up on the stage rightfully as they should be. And it occurred to me that for all those initiatives that are launched at the, you know, whether it's a government initiative at the national state or local level, whether it's corporate or brand led, whether it's led by industry organizations, labor unions, you know, academic institutions, trade schools, et cetera, those are all awesome initiatives, right? We can't have too many of those things happening out there. But as I started thinking about it, all those initiatives when they start off are inherently siloed. They're sitting in these little stovepipes. And what I mean by that is they're focused on a specific industry or they're focused on a specific trade or a specific region or a community or a cohort within that community. And again, those focus points are all really important. I think the challenge though, from a marketing standpoint, we want to think of it that way, or a perception standpoint, better way to say it, is that they're all talking about this very important issue in slightly different terms, right? They've all got different brands for their initiatives and their programs and all that stuff, which I get. Identity is important. The challenge with that, however, is it creates a lot of noise out there, a lot of dissonance. And that really, I, th you know, from my vantage point, that has prevented this issue from really getting to signal so that it can, you know, rise to the, you know, into our national consciousness. And so when I think about what we're doing with the various elements of Rock the Trades and that workforce uh, development initiative, um, and, and you know, we can talk more about those elements, but you know, I think at the highest level, what we're really trying to do is say, look, Rock the Trades is really a rallying cry. It's a rallying cry that can be leveraged by all those programs and all those initiatives so that we together can start to raise the volume but do it in a way where we're, again, increasing signal on this issue. And I think the best examples of this are when you think about, you know, memes and everybody thinks about memes like, you know, grumpy cats or other, you know, silly things that nonetheless go crazy viral. Those memes, those constructs can be very powerful. And just to, to kind of give you some examples, and I'm going to date myself here, but I go back to the 80s. I remember coming up and in high school and uh, college and, you know, uh, Reagan era, Nancy Reagan's just say no, right? Just say no to drugs was a meme before memes were even memes. But that like raised the issue to the national consciousness. You bring, you know, closer to where you and I sit today, you have racial injustice, you know, Black Lives Matter, stop Asian hate. You have sexual harassment, sexual abuse, the Me Too movement. And again, I'm not drawing any sort of comparison or equivalency to these issues. However, I will say that those, those memes, those constructs, those rallying cries really became very concrete things that can start to shift perception in the mindset of America, of America, and allow organizations, companies, individuals, and all these enti entities to sort of rally around the cause, right? In, in a coordinated way. And so, you know, from my vantage point, it, you know, if we're successful or as we're successful with Rock the Trades, it's how do we create that big tent social impact movement and message to really, you know, create this come one, come all atmosphere that will bring those initiatives together. But most importantly, pull in all collar folks, not just, you know, the blue collar households that already understand the value of these career paths uh, into the conversation. And, you know, my, my, go, my dream is to, you know, be on social media someday and see in, in a white, in my white collar bubble, right? My echo chamber, and I get out there, right? The, the nature of my work. But, you know, when I look at my network and when we see parents, uh, white collar parents, wildly celebrating their kids getting into, you know, Tulsa uh, uh, Welding Academy or, or American Welding Academy or some other trade school as wildly as they would if they got into, you know, UCLA, Stanford or Delaware or whatever, then I, then I, I feel like we're going to be making some progress towards shifting that narrative and that perception. So long answer, but yeah, that was a setup question. <laughs> yeah, no, it. Uh, uh, I, yeah. I, I don't. I couldn't agree more. You know, with that, and that is the question, right? That's the question that we're all chasing. How do we get the skilled trades as a whole to the same level as some of these other social movements? You know, because it's in my eyes just as important. You know, because of. I mean, you said it before. I mean, civilization itself. You look outside the window. You can't throw a rock without hitting something that was 
you know, a result of the trades. And I think that's probably our biggest challenge, you know, if, if I were asked that question, because it is just, it's everywhere, right? And when something is everywhere, it's taken for granted. And when it's taken for granted, it's not really thought about. Uh, I often make the uh, association to the sock on the dryer or the penny on the dresser, you know, that just stays there for months and months and months because you don't even see it anymore. You know, it's the same thing when we charge our phone at night, we, we plug it in, we don't, we don't, you know, think to ourselves, man, I'm so thankful that we have electricians that allow me to do this or, you know, when we're washing our hands, uh, you know, at the kitchen sink or the bathroom sink, we don't sit and, and say, well, I'm so thankful that I've got plumbers out there to bring me clean water, you know, because this is all stuff that we touch and feel every single day. It's, it's almost ingrained in us. But I think going back to our earlier conversation, you may have been onto something when you called them industrial artists, you know, and, and maybe, you know, when I say, when I say marketing or perception, you know, maybe it's the terms like that that need to be presented with a little bit more force to, you know, the people out there to remind them and say, hey, you know what, these aren't just grunt workers. These aren't just people getting their hands dirty. You know, these are artists performing a valuable service that shape civilization as we see it today. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, as you were talking, you know, I was thinking like, look, everyone will listen to this podcast or watch this video and you'll think about Zoom, right? Think about the platform we're using to do this, right? That's all high tech and software and bits and bytes and code and whatnot. But this doesn't happen without, you know, someone that's pulling fiber, right? Or maintaining cell towers. I mean, these are the people we're talking about. So that's why I'm saying like, there is, I, I totally agree with you that there are these unsung heroes, these professions that have somehow fallen sort of below this level of visibility. And, and I would say that, you know, two of the things, it really ties into the core of Rock the Trades is there's three things we're doing. One, as I said, we're honoring those who are in the trades. You mentioned Barbie the Welder at the top of our conversation. We commissioned her to do a, 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 a metal art sculpture, which is since she's named the Tradesman. <laughs> Uh, we're talking about tradeswoman, uh, by the way, as a future project. Um, but the idea was to sort of create this physical manifestation of the glory of the trades, right? And you know, how do we start to restore, you know, the the this perception? What used to be in the '40s and '50s, you know, going in the skilled trades. My grandfather was in the textile industry, worked in a factory, and he had big house on the hill as a pillar in his community, and and so on. And I think, by the way, there are many folks that have very big houses, multiple houses on you know, hundreds of acres. So it's not a financial conversation at all. You make a ton of money in the trades. But somewhere along the line, they become this sort of fallback path, right, for folks, right? If you, if you can't hack college, then you should go into the trades. And that's just a patently false narrative from our vantage point. And so I, what I would say is beyond honoring the trades and bringing on influencers like Barbie and others, truly folks that are artists and craftsmen and women in the trades that they're doing, putting them on the stage so little Johnny or Janie in middle school can say, because that's when I think we got to be reaching these folks, is they can see that person up on the stage and that person looks like them, right? So from a diversity and inclusion standpoint, we're truly this come one, come all proposition. But we have these role models, these icons that are up on the, if not uh, literal, the figurative stage to, uh, to look up to and say, hey, I'm inspired. That looks really awesome. I'd love to go do that for my career, right? So that, that starts to shift the narrative. And then I think the other two things that we're doing are equally important. One is uh, to inform information, knowledge is power. And, you know, there's just not enough good information around starting a career in the trades. You know, you've written a great book with Blue is the New White. I read it, loved it, as you know, um, lines up very well with kind of our thinking and what we're up to. Um, but there's just really not, you know, there's a dearth of really good, solid information around, well, what if I want to become a machinist or uh, a boiler maker. You know, how much money can I make? What does it look? What do the jobs look like? What's that? Like, what's that life experience? You know, all those things. So, you know, again, that's a relatively easy thing to do in the sense that people have that knowledge. We just need to put it out there, right? In a way, and, and we're meeting these, and we do it in a way that meets folks where they live and work today, right? So it's easy to access. So that's sort of the second leg of of what we're doing with Rock the Trades. And I think the third is empowerment. Right? How do we how do we enable folks to get into the trades, uh, build a career over 20, 30 years plus in the trades, be successful, 
And, you know, uh, we're launching our Rock the Trade scholarship uh, here in, in uh, by month end. Uh, we'll be announcing that. We'll be opening up for applications for the spring cohort in August. So that's putting our money where our mouth is, right? Um, and we'll be aggressively, you know, growing that fund over time. Um, and then I think beyond that, it's about what are the sort of tools and things that we can do um, to help enable them, you know, explore career paths, uh, find the training that they need to become that boilermaker, become that machinist or welder. And then once they're in the industry, once they're in the trades, how do we help them find that first job? How do we help them advance their career? And oh, by the way, when they're on the sort of back end of that career life cycle and they're looking to retire or semi-retire, how can we connect those tradespeople back around with those thinking about entering the trades and really close the loop? And so those are things that with Rock the Trades, the you know broader initiative, um, the scholarship fund, and the Rock the Trades app, which you can find on uh, Apple Store or Google Play, which right now is focused on the job matching side, really what Surehand was focused on. But over the next you know you know couple quarters, we're going to be expanding the focus of that, the value and the features in that app to serve those that are pre-career, thinking about oh maybe I'd like to be a welder. How do I do that? That's awesome. I, I'm I'm so excited about the the whole rock the trades uh, movement, if you will. You know, I think I think you said it best uh, earlier in this podcast. You know how how a lot of people need to show up on day one with the skills, right? And I think a what's important for people to understand those those that are listening to this show is that's so important because this industry is growing so quickly. The industry is growing faster than the profession is you know, across the, the trades in general. And that's what's leading to this problem or perpetuating the problem, I should say, you know, of the, the shortage of, of skilled labor and, and things like that. Because, you know, companies are, are in growth mode in these industries and they're wanting people to come in, you know, and, and help build that organization right away. And a lot of times, and I can't speak for all companies, of course, you know, but a lot of times what that ends up doing is it ends up, taking priority over uh, raising the tide for all the ships. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because they're so focused on what's right here. You know, it's, hey, get in, get to work, you know, let's go. We're going to grow this company. We're going to grow this business, you know, et cetera, and so forth. You know, but that that one track thought process, that one track mind, you know, needs to expand a little bit, you know, for, from all areas. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I love the the Rock the Trades movement because I think it will it will it will help not only people understand what the trades are or that they're a career option, but also companies as to why it's important for the industries as a whole. Yeah, look, I'll tell you the when you look at those sectors, right? Energy, manufacturing, construction, you can read every single day about the labor shortages in the skilled trade and even even sort of semi-skilled, you know, uh, general labor as well. I mean, it, this is becoming a real problem for these employers. And so, you know, and by extension, that's going to have an impact on the rest of us, right? So that's why I say this isn't just a problem that affects the people working in the trades who might want to work in the trades. It impacts every single one of us. And we, we are looking at sort of a perfect storm, if you will. And I see this as an opportunity where we've talked about this narrative, right? This, the, the disparity between this, you know, white collar career path versus blue collar career path, college first narrative. Um, there's also the dynamic of the baby boomer generation is aging out of the workforce. And they have, you know, they have held a uh, much, uh, a disproportionately higher percentage of skilled trade jobs. Like if you look at the average age or median age of a tradesperson, whether they're, you know, a welder or whether they're in construction or, other trades, it's, you know, it's in the mid forties, right? It's above the, you know, the average median age across all professions. But then you look at the median age of a software developer and it's 27. And so you start to see that discrepancy and I go, okay, now, now we've sort of got that dynamic generationally happening. Um, and then I, and then I think the other thing is we're coming off this pandemic. We're about to reboot the economy, you know, at some point, out of DC, I expect that there's going to be some infrastructure stimulus, whatever that looks like. It's going to be many billions, if not a trillion dollars going into our nation's infrastructure. And, you know, it's great if you have the money, but if you don't have the hardworking people to do the job, then that's a challenge. 
Um, and then I think the third thing to your point earlier is that, you know, the, I think the last 15 months or so living in, in you know, grinding through this pandemic together, um, I don't think that there's a person, at least in my circles that I've spoken to, whatever their career, you know, blue, white collar, everybody in between, um, that hasn't really thought about their career choices, their past, the work-life balance, how they live, what they really want to do, um, and all these things, let alone, you know, you know, my son's a freshman in college, my daughter's a, a junior in high school, they're about to make these decisions. I know they're contemplating, well, what's the right path for me? Everything has changed. And so I do think that while the last, you know, 15 months or so have been really difficult and tragic for too many, um, I do think it's a sort of a natural cycle of disruption that allows us or affords us the opportunity to really reshape the narrative as it relates to career paths in the skilled trades. And that's why we're leaning into rock the trade so, you know, so heavily. And as you know, I've shared with you before, we're just getting going and we've already got a lot of momentum, a lot of energy building up uh, behind this initiative. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very, very well said. And I think at the end of the day, at least, at least for me, you know, it, of course, it's about the skilled trades gap. I'm in the business. I I understand it. I'm I'm feeling the same pain, you know, uh, with with finding help that uh, that a lot of the other companies in in my realm are experiencing. But at the end of the day, you know, my heart goes out to the the youth of the nation, right? And and that is really my focus, is presenting these kids with another opportunity for them to see success. So they don't have to think for their entire high school career or even into their college career or thereafter that it's either college or minimum wage for the rest of their life. And I think a lot of them are under that impression. So, you know, it's it's just so important. And on the topic of success, I know we're running short on time. I got one more question to ask you that I love to ask all my guests. Um, a big thing about the trades is, is being able to to try different ones and and really define success for yourself, right? And not let somebody else tell you what success is for you to to, to decide what that means to you. So, CB, I'm curious from you, what is your definition of success, and how are how is what you're doing today helping you achieve that? Uh, that's a great question, and, and and you know, I think success is individual. I think there's no, there is no uh, standard criteria for success. Everybody has, you know, different places, different priorities on different things. I think for me, I, if I look again, as I look across my career, and I'll, I'll just speak to professional success, right? Because, you know, I would say success for me at the highest level is about being a good human, right? Like I'm just trying to be a good human on this earth and, you know, do the best I can in my personal and professional lives to, to live that, right? So I think that's just my own credo. But I think professionally in the work that I do, like if I think about career success, it's never about, it's never been for me about the financial side of it. I've always felt that, you know, if I worked hard, if I were solving problems out there and making a difference in the world, those other sort of nuts and bolts things would sort themselves out, right? And I would say that looking back over the last 30 years, you know, I can say for me, just in my case, uh, it's worked out that way. Um, but I would say that making a difference uh, is really important to me. And I think knowing that at the end of my run, whenever that is, we're probably going to live till, you know, who knows now, north of hundreds, careers may last <laughs> into our 80s, right? We'll see how long we want to stay at this. But, you know, I guess for me, I want to know that in the end, it made a difference. It helped people, right? And, and that's that's truly my motivation. And I think that, and, and look, you you can be, you know, this whole uh, sort of emerging uh, notion of stakeholder capitalism that a lot more companies are embracing and rallying around, which is like, you know, these large companies have uh, really, frankly, have a mandate to all those uh, sort of around them in, in, in society. It's not just their shareholders, right? It's not just their customers and business partners. Um, it's also about, you know, the broader world that lives around them. And I just think you're seeing a lot more of that that involvement, that ownership, that leadership where companies are trying to go out there and make a difference in parallel with all these other organizations, you know, be they government or industry. Uh, and so, uh, 
again, I think for me, just being able to make that difference. And, and you know, fortunately for us, with Stanley Black & Decker, with our mission with SureHand, uh, which at the highest level is to, you know, reduce labor shortages in the industrial sector and at the same time, eliminate underemployment in the skilled trades. And I would argue eliminate underemployment, period. Because, you know, the crazy thing, as you said, there's a lot of people that have the aptitude, interest, probably ability to get these jobs that pay two, three, four times minimum wage, and they just keep missing each other. They're just not connecting. So, you know, if it's as simple as us connecting the dots, that's going to make me happy and fulfilled as a, as a human, as a good human. Uh, it certainly helps us achieve our mission at surehand.com. And again, I'm just grateful for, you know, our investors and in Stanley Black & Decker, their commitment. Um, you know, they talk a lot about for those who make the world. That's their tagline. That's the center of their mission. And I'm telling you, they walk the talk. They put their money where their mouth is. So I'm excited to see where we can take Rock the Trades together as we pull in other organizations. We just brought on uh, American Welding Society as one of our, uh, who we call our roadie partners to help us spread the good word on the, the initiative. And there's lots more to follow uh, there. And we're adding uh, new influencers all the time. So again, we, we pull all that off. I'll be a happy camper. Awesome. CB, where can people find the Rock the Trades initiative, Surehand, all that fun stuff? Yeah, uh, just you, we're on uh, social media. We focus on Instagram uh, and LinkedIn, our primary channel. So if you want to engage with the mission and all those that are coming on board, those are the two best places to do it. Um, and then if you want to learn more about uh, the initiative and all that, I would go to uh, just go to rockthetrades.com. We've got a lot of great programs spinning up. As I said, we're going to be opening up the scholarship for applications for the spring uh, cohort uh, here in August. And there'll be a lot, uh, a lot more on that as we move into the fall as we bring on other funding partners and so on. So, Awesome. Well, CB, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. I really appreciate your time, man. Hey, my pleasure, Josh. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on and always uh, appreciate the discussion. Absolutely, buddy. Take care.